Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. Okay, we have a beautiful, somewhat complicated show for you this week, which we trust you are going to be able to go with us on. First, we're going to be talking to Sloane Crosley about her memoir, Grief is for People. The book is about loss, the loss of her dear friend Russell, and also the loss of a bunch of jewelry that was burgled. You rarely get to use uh, that word in that form from her Brooklyn apartment, which then sends Sloan on this dangerous mission to try to track it down. Then, speaking of dyed-in-the-wool New Yorkers, we are going to talk to legendary New Yorker cartoonist Ross Chast about her latest book, I Must Be Dreaming. It is about dreams, but it is not boring, I promise. Then we're going to get some music from Black Belt Eagle Scout. This episode is for people who can handle complicated things. If that's not you, keep scrolling. For the rest of you, though, stick around. It all gets started right after this. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going great. Look at you. New haircut. This is radio, so we could describe my hair in a completely different way, like I got a mohawk or something. What do you think? It really works for you. (laughs) Hey, are you ready to play a little station location identification examination? Absolutely. All right. Here is the part of the show where I quiz Elena on a place in the country where Livewire is on the radio. She's got to guess uh, where we're talking about. For many decades, the motto of this town's local paper masthead has been covers Harney County like the sagebrush. Okay, so we're somewhere in the American West. It's their sagebrush there. It's a a place that people maybe don't always think of as being kind of uh, sagebrush country, but it's I'll tell you this, it's it's relatively close to home for us. Oh, so maybe it's somewhere in eastern Oregon. It is in Oregon. Okay, here's the here's the giveaway. It's named after a famous Scottish poet. Oh, well, that would be Burns. That's Oregon. right. I didn't think to finish the cl- <laughs> the clue. That's exactly right. It is Burns, Oregon, where we are on K O B N. I didn't know that Burns, Oregon, was named after Robert Burns. I barely even got Scottish poet. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew it was Burns, Oregon. I knew you'd know that. All right. Should we get to the show? Let's do it. All right. Take it away. From PRX, it's... Live This week, author Sloan Crosley. I was sent these self-help books. And I'm not trying to trash the whole genre, but it was like insane how much it left out the one relationship that everyone in this room has. You don't all have parents. You don't all have siblings. You don't all have children. You all have one friend. And cartoonist Roz Chast. An interior decorator told me this fact, which was uh, that cushions are the juice of the house. (laughs) With music from Black Belt Eagle Scout and our fabulous house band, I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now, the host of LiveWire, Luke Burbank. Thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone tuning in from all over the country, including uh, Burns, Oregon. We have a great show in store for you this week. We're going to cover sort of a range of topics. We're going to talk about grief. We're going to talk about dreams. And of course, we've asked the LiveWire listeners a question, as we like to do. We asked, what's something you dream about? a surprising amount. And uh, we're going to hear the responses to that question coming up in a moment. First, though, it's time for the best news we heard all week. This This is our little reminder at the top of the show that there is some good news happening out there in the world. You just got to look for it. Elena, what is the best news that you've heard all week? Well, uh, the the bad news is that I am talking about sports again, which my own father has commented Tony on. P? It's a it's a slippery slope for me. Tony P was like, "Oh, the, you did a basketball story. Uh, what a risk!" I thought that was a great <laughs> topic for you. I like your you bring fresh eyes to the whole concept of sports, Elena, and I dig that. Well, did you know, Luke Burbank, that before the baseball season starts, all of the baseball teams go to warm places and they train and it's in the springtime. So it's called spring training. Did you know about this? It's ringing some bells. This is ringing a bell. Also, when they go do spring training, they bring a couple dozen minor league umpires to referee or to call these major league teams when they're doing the spring training games. It's a sort of rite of passage, and it's also a prerequisite to get called up to the big show if you're an umpire to get invited to be a part of this crew at spring training. And this year, one of the 24 minor league umpires that is headed to spring training is 47-year-old Jen Powell. 
She has proven herself to be a superstar in the umpire world over the past eight years. She's risen to prominence with just an incredible momentum, and she is at the top of her field right now. She's called a championship. She's the class AAA crew chief, which is the most senior rank, I guess, in her league. She's training umpires. uh, So she's really, really like on her way. And this momentum is making people speculate that she might become the first woman in history to call a regular season MLB game. She's basically just one step away from uh, breaking that glass ceiling. About dang time. Women are already officiating in the NBA and the NFL, both the WNBA and the MNBA, I guess you would call it. That would actually be a great flex. Let's start calling it the MNBA as well, since we have to call it the WNBA. Done. Yeah, I'm, that is done and done. And actually, two women may have been at these spring training events before, but just decades apart from each other. A woman in the 80s and a woman in the early 2000s, about 25 years ago, both of whom have been texting accolades to Jen Powell uh, people are like stopping her like while she's like going on and off the field. She's developing her own fandoms. She's intensely modest as a person. But I am so excited that Major League Baseball has found an incredible candidate to call all those touchdowns uh-huh. and double dribbles yeah, slam dunks. and hat tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to hopefully anyway, Jen Powell to the MLB. Hey, I have a story that I saw out of the Bronx, New York, the Boogie Down Bronx, uh, which I was just so kind of tickled by this story. Now, in my capacity as a uh, sort of micro celebrity of the local media scene, I have been involved in various charity fundraisers. And what I've noticed about helping out with fundraisers is that there's a whole industry in separating very wealthy people from some amount of their money so as to help support causes that need supporting. But the thing is that it seems like a lot of times that support comes with a string, which is, could you also uh, name the building after me or somebody in my family or someone who I, you know, I want to honor? Like, Right. Let let my son go to school here and all of his sons and his sons and his sons. There seems to be a certain, I don't know, quid pro quo in this world. And uh, so when I saw that the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx had received the largest ever private donation to a medical school of a billion dollars from somebody named Ruth Gottesman. I assumed that they would be changing the name to the Ruth Gottesman College of Medicine, but they are in fact not because Ruth Gottesman, who has a long association with the school, she actually joined their Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center in the 1960s when she was working with children with learning disabilities. She has donated a billion dollars to this medical school so that no one there has to pay tuition for the foreseeable future. Because, of course, medical school tuition is is an unbelievable financial pressure on people. Well, this is, at least at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, not going to be the case. They got all of the students together for an emergency meeting. And there are these great photos of these med students finding out that someone was donating a billion dollars to the school and that for the incoming folks, they would have no tuition for over the course of the years. For the the folks who are about to graduate, this is retroactive for back one year, so their last year is covered. And then to the young people out there who are not even of medical school age, they will be able to go here at no cost. And the thing that is to me so charming about this is that there are no strings attached to this. I love the quote from one of the professors uh, who said, I suspect we're going to need a much bigger admissions committee, <laughs> which is the like academic yeah. version of you're going to need a bigger boat. Yep. <laughs> a bigger application reading boat. That's going to change medicine, don't you think? That's going to make a big difference. Yeah. So uh, that is absolutely the best news that I heard this week. All right, let's welcome our first guest on over to the program. She is the author of the novels Cult Classic, as well as The Clasp, plus three essay collections, including I Was Told There'd Be Cake, and How Did You Get This Number? Her latest book, Grief is for People, explores multiple kinds of loss following the death of a very close friend. Booklist calls it a searching, impassioned, cathartic, and loving 
Elegy. And just a heads up for folks, this interview does address the topic of suicide. So take care when listening to our conversation with Sloan Crosley. This was recorded at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Hello, Sloan. Welcome back Hi. to the show. Hi. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm completely delighted to be here. This book is really, really incredible. Oh, I was telling you, you backstage that I sat down with the intention of, of kind of reading a little bit of it so that I could stay, you know, up on my assignments. And I just read <laughs> the whole thing. Who's giving these assignments? The producers. Oh, yeah. They insist I read the books before interviewing the Ew. authors. What a drag. I know, right? Serious buzzkill. <laughs> um, but I... I found the book just so uh, so engrossing, and I mean, it is about grief. It's about the loss of your very dear friend, but it's also a real page turner <laughs> because it, it sort of has you trying to solve a mystery around a burglary in your apartment. Can you kind of talk about what happened there? Yeah. Um, well, the lesson of the story is going to be don't mess with anyone who works freelance. <laughs> a tremendous amount of time to hunt you down. <laughs> um, basically, I was burglarized in um, 2019. Uh, I left the house for one hour, came back. There were muddy footprints on my bed, a couple of smashed little cabinets, um, and all my jewelry was gone. Um, anything I had been left by my grandmother, anything she had been left, anything I would leave somebody, gone, gone, gone. And it's maybe worth noting that, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not someone... I wouldn't target me. <laughs> it just sort of happened. Um, and as I was trying to solve this, I was, of course, consulting my best friend who I used to work with um, at Random House, who was my boss for 20 years when I worked in book publishing. Um, and then we had dinner in uh, late July. And it's funny because he, the last words he ever said to me, I'm just going to bum us out right away. Um, the last words he ever said to me um, when I was upset about the jewelry, he hugged me and he said, well, you know, if it helps, you can't take it with you when you go. Hmm. And then three days later, he died by suicide. Hmm. Sorry, I told you. Um, I mean, but also he's a wildly funny person. I don't know. But yeah, the book's so the book not called like Comedy is for People, okay? It's called <laughs> Grief is for People. So if I have the order of events right in the book, you come back to your apartment and you find it sort of torn apart. You call the police first. But then your friend Russell mm. is pretty much the next person you call. Yes. Why, yeah. why, why call him in that moment? I think, you know, there was this, I, I, I'm trying not to go on a tangent that I don't even have the authority to, to discuss really. But do you know what the schmoo is? Mm -mm. Okay. It's like some, somebody here knows. <laughs> it was like an old cartoon, I think in the, maybe in the forties or the fifties. And it was this animal that was an everything animal. It could be your pet. You could eat it. You could, you know, it's companionship. It would defend you. Like it was all these things. And Russell's <laughs> friendship with me or mm. my friendship with him was like that. Mm. Where like he was the person I would call, you know, he's just sort of the person. And what was weird to your point is that when I called him, he seemed really sort of unmoored, not by the missing jewelry, but by the shelves that had been smashed that we mm -hmm. brought together. And it seemed like this weird avoidant upset. Because he was a, he loved like antiquing and yeah. things. And so he had, He's where the, the jewelry was. the only gay man in America that loves <laughs> yes. antiquing. He's blazing a real trail. <laughs> really, truly. With the antiquing yeah. for the gays. So he, <laughs> he, had, he had, you know, kind of talked you into buying this spice kind yeah. of drawer that you had the jewelry in. And, and you say in that moment, he was focusing on the piece of furniture, mm -hmm. you think, because the jewelry was too hard for, and maybe even what was going on at that point for him internally. I think so too. But that's like, I mean, it's deference. People, people, mm -hmm. people do this. But then, yeah, after he dies, I got sort of re-energized to find some of the jewelry, which obviously is like impossible. There's no clues. I actually want to, I want to talk about the hunt for the jewelry after yeah. this short break, because it okay. involves you doing some, some real sleuthing. Yeah. And also it, it, it brings me to a topic of your previous experience on eBay, which I was frankly somewhat shocked to read about. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. How about that for a teaser folks? It's live wire. We're talking to Sloan Crosley. Her book is grief is for people. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. 
We are at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland talking to Sloane Crosley about uh, her latest book, Grief is for People. Uh, the book is about the loss of your dear friend, Russell, uh, kind of intertwined with uh, this burglary that happened in your apartment, which, you know, throughout the book, it, it, it becomes pretty clear that this jewelry that's been stolen from, by the way, passed down to you by a grandmother that you point out was a bad person. <laughs> oh, yeah, I say the line is, I've never met anyone who misses her. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're out there, but I just haven't met them. <laughs> so, so like, despite the provenance of the jewelry that was stolen, or at least some of it, it becomes, it almost it sounds like it takes on a sort of extra importance to you because it's, it's clearly standing in for this other grief that you're trying to process, uh, which is the suicide of your dear friend. So you set about to try to get the stuff back, and at one point you're going on, like, Craigslist and eBay and all these places, and you mention in the book that your only experience with selling something on eBay was selling a signed copy of The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown that you, <laughs> you basically nicked at your work? <laughs> what? Well, how much do you get for something like that? What? <laughs> um, so basically, so Russell used to always encourage us. I worked for Vintage Books. He hired me, uh, sort of almost made me work there, which is sort of sweet. Uh, it turned out to be a great choice. But, you know, it's a very, uh, well... High um publishing house. It's the paperback arm of Knopf. Um, and sometimes he would encourage us to go and get our books signed if an author was signing stock. So I have books because he would encourage us to do this. You know, that I've, I've like signed things of Mirakami that are first edition, mm. Philip Roth, all this stuff. But I thought he was encouraging it for like everything. So I was like, well, Dan Brown's on another floor. I'll just go get him to sign this copy of the <laughs> Da Vinci Code. Which is not to say if you guys love the Da Vinci Code, I've never read it, so I can't trash it. I don't know. But the point is, is I keep trying to unload it because I just, I don't know, I didn't like the spine. I didn't like the cut of its jib. Really? <laughs> yeah. This isn't even about the contents. It's, isn't it's it like a bunch shiny. of like gears or clocks it's or like, it's a it's code red or something? And it's got like an up close of, you know, Leo. I don't know. Um, and so every time I try to, you know, discard it, I'd realize it was signed and I'd put it back. And then finally I sold it. And it took forever. Nobody wanted it. Sorry, Dan Brown. I'm sure you're listening. He's underwriting the program, and um, <laughs> well, he's getting name dropped an awful lot. <laughs> was underwriting the program actually, but so that so I feel like when I tried to find some of the jewelry, I mm -hmm. had this like thought that you know some of the stuff is pretty expensive, and maybe it won't go that fast when I tried to find it. Yeah, because you did find it eventually. I found some of it, and I um, I told you the lesson of the story was do not mess with anyone who works freelance. That's what I said. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to give that part I away. I did find some stuff. You know, something uh, that you write about in the book or you mention is an Italian author saying something to the effect of writing about your grief is not going to fix it for you. Natalia Ginsburg, yeah. And I'm paraphrasing there, but t to that effect, what was it like for you to write this? And how did that affect, for better or for worse, the grief that you still feel? This is a very good question. In a way, it's like the question. Um, I feel like there's a sense of everyone assumes catharsis. You must feel so much better. And I always feel like that is for your emails that are ideally unsent, um, <laughs> as well as, you know, diary entries. I just feel like the idea, I think, even with my humor writing and even with the novels, my experience of it is that you sort of take a sliver of yourself and you offer it up and it gets like spun out in this centrifuge of readers forever. So you actually sort of are sacrificing a piece of you that never gets over it. Mm. Um, so it would, I'm very upset. <laughs> yeah. But I also feel like I can have both. I mean, it doesn't make the book pointless because I didn't get over it. Well, I mean, I think this is a really incredible book, and it had me thinking about grief. You describe your grief in a way a lot of us have felt and maybe not had words for. Um, Thank you. Sometimes. Um, and I was wondering, could you actually read a little passage from the book? Oh, you really you picked a bummer. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say, I, I, it is a funny book. That's the, all. <laughs> the, the, the book is the book is very very readable. It's very funny. I the reason that this this section spoke to me is because you you talk about suicide and 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 your thoughts on it as it related to your friend in a way that I hadn't really thought about. Thank you. And also about the bullshit that people say to yeah. people who are grieving. Oh, yeah, that, that is, is unhelpful. You know. Right. So I think it encapsulates kind of a lot. Okay. Thank you. When you die by suicide, you die alone. With few exceptions, you die alone. I don't think people talk about this enough when they talk about suicide, if they talk about it at all. The ending of one's life is the thing. Taking attendance seems like splitting hairs. But I cannot get over it. 
my friend was alone when he was murdered. I repeated out loud, opting for a purposefully obscured angle on the story and then scanning for errors. But facts check out. My friend was alone when he was murdered. I don't quite have the ego to think I could have stopped a cogent 52-year-old man with no history of depression or therapy and no prior attempts at self-harm from taking his own life. Still, there are those who will unsolicited tell me that I shouldn't blame myself. These people are idiots. Or else they are projecting their own losses and are also idiots. (laughs) I am angry. It's too soon to be this angry. I know the stages of grief are not linear, nor are they solid enough to be hidden under shells and slid around. But something is off. Russell and I do not share children, a mortgage, or business. But then I realize this anger is a false positive. I'm not angry at Russell. I am angry at everyone except for Russell. A guy on a city bike rounds a corner and stops so close, he hits my wrist. When he won't apologize, I run after him, suggesting he go f*** his mother. (laughs) My super, who tends to make conversation by scolding people, knocks on my door to lecture me about a package I've left languishing on the lobby radiator for a day. Instead of thanking him and moving on, I snap at him. This panic about everyone's belongings is a little late, don't you think? Don't take the burglary out on me, I tell him, even though I am, at present, taking Russell's death out on him. Later, I will feel great shame about this interaction. I start shutting out friends. With some, I can't stand to see my pain reflected in their eyes. There are craters in their timelines, ancient holes in the shape of someone gone too soon. But I don't want to be around more entrenched versions of myself. I barely want to be around this version. Others knew Russell the same way I did, worked with him too, spent those summers on his porch too. But we have all committed the sin of not being able to bring him back. Still others offer me pat wisdom that sounds as if it's been vetted by general counsel. I can tell I'm being handled. They assure me I won't feel like this forever. Oh yeah? Everyone's a psychic when you're sad. With more casual connections, I've always held the watering can of our two-person garden, and now I can just put it down. If all it takes is one unanswered text to kill the friendship, then that's all it takes. When a newer friend hears the news secondhand, she calls, but there's a strange racket in the background. She's bottling vinegar, lots of vinegar, unholy amounts of vinegar. I comment on the cacophony of glass, hoping that she will take the hint. Is this the best soundtrack for the story of a hanging? but the noise shows no sign of abating. She's multitasking a condolence call. I can't do this, I say, and hang up on her. That Sloan Crosley reading from Grief is for people. Um, The title of the book, Grief is for People, when I first picked up, I didn't really know what that meant. And then in the book, it becomes clear that what you are learning is that Grief is for when we lose people. It's not for when we lose stuff. You're sad about your jewelry. Yeah. You're grieving about your friend. Was that something that you had given any thought to before these two things came into your, your life? The title is sort of intentionally blunt. And in a way, I don't think it's true. It's woven in so that, like, obviously it's made clear, hopefully, several times in the book that I'm not conflating the severity of a burglary with the severity of my friend's suicide or anyone's suicide. Um, but he had this thing for objects. He loved them. I talk about how it's so much of his spirit and his sort of, like, he had these, like, annexes of things. Like, it wasn't, he would buy some, like, heinous flamingo-shaped ashtray from the flea market, and it just wasn't enough for you to compliment it. You had to, like, agree how great it was. (laughs) Or he'd be like, give it back. You don't get to hold it. (laughs) Like, like, okay, I don't know. We're in an office. I just, like... um, But, you know, he's just sort of this person who just, like, loved the past, loved books... Um, lived so much in the past, which is, I think, in part of what happened to him. I think the world changed a lot around him, and it's dangerous mm-hmm. for someone with that level of nostalgia for it. But, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's for a lot of the book is about finding your place as the friend who's experienced a loss. Because so much is, you know, I was sent these self-help books And I'm not trying to trash the whole genre, but it was like insane how much it left out the one relationship that everyone in this room has. Mm -hmm. You don't all have parents. You don't all have siblings. You don't all have children. You all have one friend, um, I hope. 
it's a lot about like finding my place and like who mm. is grief for. I'm curious though, you describe your friend Russell, we're talking to Sloane Crosley, by the way, about her book, Grief is for People. Um, you describe him as having this kind of interesting personality where he didn't really say I love you to you. He wasn't directly effusive to you or if you, you dedicated a previous book to him and he was kind of like, there's all the other people you should have dedicated to, yeah. but then you heard that he went around the office the next day showing everyone the dedication. Mm -hmm. Like he had that kind of personality. Yeah, like a weasel. <laughs> like a weasel. <laughs> I believe the, the DSM-5 calls it a weasel disorder. I mean, n not to ask you to speculate, but I mean, yeah. my God, how would that guy feel about the fact that there's a room full of people in Portland, Oregon, and untold other radio listeners hearing about him, thinking about him in this moment? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think his first instinct would again be to be like, isn't there something better to write about? Because he, I mean, this is someone, and part of that is him teasing me. Um, part of that is humility. And then I think a bigger part than I realized, clearly, is about this sort of propensity towards self-erasure, obviously. It's one thing to not like attention on your birthday because I don't know, your sign's a cancer. And it's a different thing to do it because you don't want to be seen. What's the, the line in the book that someone else is writing that said, you can't tear out a page from your life, but you can burn the whole book. Yeah, Georges Sand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and he burned the whole book. He burned the entire book. And I think the thing is, is that um, he would probably be proud of me. He likes, he wanted me to do well. I'm telling you, we had this relationship that was almost father daughtery where it's like, as long as, you know, the book does well, I think he would have this like messed up sense of himself as like, honestly, this is really dark, but like, grist for the mill or something like that, that that it's good that I made this story out of this and not understanding but part of the struggle of the book is like trying to almost mm. explain to him in absentia how wrong he was I mean I have a line in it this is gross I'm quoting myself but I have a line in it where I say something like um how hard it is to love someone who is just so wrong and who will never be right again yeah you know mm. well I have to say it is a incredibly well-written book. Thank you. So thanks for writing and thanks for sharing your friend Russell with us. Thank you. Sloan Crosley, everyone, right here on LiveWire. <laughs> that was Sloan Crosley right here on LiveWire. Her new book, Grief is for People, is available right now. Hey, special thanks this episode to Heidi Festin of Brandywine, Maryland. Sounds delicious. And Daniel Muller of Banks, Oregon. They are part of the Livewire member community, and Heidi and Daniel are supporting us with a donation each month. We call it the League of Extraordinary Listeners, and there are a few more extraordinary than Daniel and Heidi. So a big thanks to them for keeping Livewire going. This is Live Wires. We do each week. We've asked our listeners a question in honor of a Roz Chast's book. You're going to hear about that coming up in a moment. We have asked the listeners, what's something you dream about? A surprising amount. Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? Okay, here's one from Karen. Karen says, I have recurring nightmares where I'm either on a cruise ship or I'm in the Hunger Games or it's a combination of both. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that is accurate to some of the cruise ship situations we've heard about over the last few years. Yeah, somebody volunteers as tribute, and then before you know it, they're on the the, the sun deck. <laughs> All right, uh, what's something else one of our listeners is dreaming about maybe a little too much? Okay, Julie says, I dream about my house. It's always either something smells weird and I spend the whole dream trying to find it but never do, or it's that all the walls are melting. <laughs> Ooh, stressful. Structurally, I think the walls dissolving is a is a more terrifying thing, but it, it's also not great having a mystery smell in your house. Oh, no. Uh, I'm dealing with that right now involving my walls, and I bought a blacklight. Don't ever do this. Somebody said if you buy a blacklight, you can find like a pet smell maybe. If I could offer one piece of advice to all of our listeners, never buy a blacklight. No good comes from that. No good. The world is full of schmutz, I guess, is just a way to think about it. 
Okay, one more dreamscape that our listeners are living in they want to tell us about. Oh, there's so many good ones. This one from Debbie is terrifying. I'm pretty insecure about my eyebrows, Debbie says. And the dream I have a lot is that I wake up and my eyebrow hairs are so long, they touch the ground. And every time I try to cut them, they grow back faster and with a vengeance. Oh, wow. (laughs) What would the dream analysis books say about that? I promise you there is one, though. Like, if you Google that, I bet you there's a bunch of people having that dream and someone thinks they know what it means. I bet it has something to do with, like, aging. Like, you know, if your teeth fall out, you're afraid of change. But I bet if your eyebrows are growing really long and they're, and they're going fast and fast, it's like, maybe it's not aging, but just time passing. Or you're turning into uh, 60 Minutes commentator Andy Rooney. <laughs> I have long held the theory that sort of good dreams, like you win the lottery or whatever, are kind of a bummer. And bad dreams, you know, like you, you, you know, lost someone or something's going wrong are kind of awesome because when you wake up from a bad dream, your thought is, oh, phew. Your life is better. Yeah. And when you wake up from a good dream, you're like, oh, for real? (laughs) That's why I only dream about shapes. (laughs) There there are no bad dreams when you dream about shapes? Just like circles or rectangles. You just wake up and you're like, that that was a rhombus, wasn't it? That's right. (laughs) On with your day. Thank you uh, to everyone who responded to our listener question this week. Speaking of dreams, let's welcome our next guest over. She's published more than a thousand cartoons in The New Yorker and has written or illustrated more than a dozen books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Her latest book is I Must Be Dreaming, and it explores the surreal nighttime world inside her mind, and it also seeks to untangle one of our most enduring human mysteries, which would be dreams. This is Roz Chast, who joined us on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Hello, Roz. Welcome to the program. Hello. This book is so interesting. I mean, it's funny, but it's also, it's, it's informative, and it's something that everybody typically has, which are dreams, and everyone is told no one cares about your dreams. That's the whole premise. And here we are. We're going to spend 20 minutes on national radio and with a captive audience talking about your dreams. Why did you inflict this on people, Roz Chast? Well, well, here's the thing. Everybody always says, like, the two things that you're really not supposed to talk about are, like, your your dreams and your aches and pains. But... I actually find all those things like more interesting than most other things. It's like, tell me like what's going on with you medically. Like, I want to know. Like, you know, t- tell me your symptoms. And it's like, like I, I like that. I'd rather hear about that than like your kids, your golf. You know, there's, there's, there's like so much that people talk about that I find so incredibly boring, much more boring than dreams or, yeah. or like aches and pains, you know? I was wondering, Roz, could you just read your, your sort of five uh, kind of bullet points or, or sentences about why dreaming is so great? I just feel like it kind of sets up the book really well and your, your love of, of dreaming. Okay, okay. This is why dreaming is so great. One, it's free entertainment. Um, Two, you don't need special clothes or equipment. Um, Three, everybody can do it. You don't need to be attractive, rich, smart, popular, healthy, or anything. Um, Four, there are no experts. Yes, there are people on the internet who are happy to tell you how to optimize your dreams. What a stupid idea. The whole point of dreams is to see where they take you. And five, they are a nightly reminder of the mystery of consciousness. I've deliberately kept REM cycles and the biomechanics of sleep out of this book because it's interesting to me, but it's not all that interesting. Right. You're not trying to, like, illustrate the definitive tome on the science of sleep. You're just telling us about the time that you met Wallace Shawn in a dream. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, I, and uh, we were walking along this street... <laughs> And, it's happening. And, I, and, I, and I, I learned, like, this very interesting fact about broccoli, that, um, <laughs> that it sort of grew out of the ground like mushrooms. Let's run through some of the categories of dreams that you've had that you feature in the book, and maybe you can expand on them a little bit. So you start with recurring dreams. Yes. Um, uh, you have one called New York Has an Unusual Neighborhood. What happens in that? Yes. Oh, it, that's like you're kind of wandering around, and like you're in Midtown, and suddenly there's a beach. <laughs> 
and you didn't know it was there. And it doesn't even, it doubly doesn't make sense because you're in Midtown, but still there's a beach. Um, I, I, or like suddenly you're walking along and there's like a desert and it's like the Sahara Desert. And like I, I had this when they were the little shells, but like eh, they were, this couple of the shells were chipped. So that was like, <laughs> you know, they were like a little bit cheesy, uh -huh. you know, a little bit like not such great shells. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that this really has to do, it's a, it's a kind of version of the, of the very typical New York dream of like, my apartment has rooms I didn't know about. Yes. And, and I think it's because, you know, space is so <laughs> right. tight that it's like, I didn't know this was a two bedroom apartment, <laughs> <Right>. you know? <laughs> this is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in my life. I have a washer and dryer <laughs> yeah. in the unit. I know, I, don't have to go I didn't to the scary know. basement. Yeah. What yeah. about, this one seems like it's right in the name, but I still would like to hear more about it. Your recurring dream called Pregnant and Old. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, that is not a happy dream. <laughs> It's like at a certain, even in my dreams, I know this should not be happening. This is really not, it, this will not end well. <laughs> um, you, you also mention uh, in your recurring dreams, an oldie but goodie, uh, I think we've all had teeth falling out. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like top five dreams, yeah. I yes. think. Yes, yes, teeth, tooth loss dreams are extremely common and have been since, you know, Egyptian times. I mean, since people started recording dreams and trying to make sense of these strange stories. Um, I also want to talk about your celebrity dreams. Okay, so because I feel like you have the most New York celebrity dreams. Like the celebrities that show up in yes. your dreams are like Fran Lebowitz and Wallace Shawn. Was like uh, Ed Koch not available? <laughs> like, it's like a very certain kind of New Yorker celebrity. Yeah, no, I don't think I've ever dreamed about Ed Koch. No, it's probably no. for the best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what happened in your your Fran Lebowitz dream? Uh, Fran Lebowitz was on a she was on a book tour mm. actually, and um, she had roller skates over her shoulder. Classic, um, classic Fran Lebowitz. Fran Lebowitz, right? <laughs> and uh, and. And I, I, I love her writing, but I find, I've never met her. I find her kind of a little bit intimidating. And even in the dream, I knew that what I was saying was like completely stupid. I, yeah. I came up to her and I said, well, if you're ever in the neighborhood, why don't you give a hoot and a holler? <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, I don't even say that. It's like, I would never say that to anybody. But like somehow I found myself saying that to her. It was very embarrassing. Yeah. We are talking to Roz Chast about her new book, I Must Be Dreaming. Um, that actually brings up something that you mentioned in the book, which is you can remember specific phrases. You can extract actual things verbatim that you said in your dream? Not always, just on occasion. And I love when that happens, because as I wrote about in the book, um, uh, I think it was Nightmare on Elm Street. There's this really terrifying scene at, that I loved, um, where the girl has a nightmare of a Freddy Krueger chasing her, and uh, she grabs his hat, and when she wakes up, she's holding his hat. And I thought- And it's a fedora. Yeah. Yeah, extra, which is a scary. very yeah. scary hat. Um, well, when I can extract a whole phrase, I, I feel like I've almost like I grabbed like Freddy Krueger's hat. I uh -huh. got something out of the dream like in its entirety. Mm. Uh, and uh, one of them in, that I mentioned in the book was um, an interior decorator told me this fact, which was uh, that cushions are the juice of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it like, it sort of, it almost makes sense, yeah. you know, yeah. but not really. <laughs> it's, it know? is that kind of thing. If you sort of squint hard enough, you can kind of, yeah. like, are they, are they the juice of the kind yeah. of are, they kind of are. Yeah. It has that ring of truth. And yeah. yet like on not this planet, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which also is my memory of like, you know, when you're having a dream that feels very profound in the moment. Yes. Like it makes perfect sense perfect to you in sense. that moment. Oh yeah, definitely. Speaking definitely. of home decor, um, I, <laughs> I, had, I happened to read a, a New York Times uh, interview with you yeah. 
about your home decorating out in Connecticut where you live. Do you really have a collection of scarves made by other cartoonists? Yes. Yes, I do. This was a thing in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. Uh, I guess it was the swag of the day. <laughs> and uh, cartoonists, uh, I have uh, really these beautiful scarves. Uh, uh, Anatole Kowarski and Jules Pfeiffer and James Thurber. Uh, the, to me, they're art. I mean, I don't wear them. I have them framed and they wow. are just beautiful. So there's kind of, there is a corner of the internet that where people are collecting these and selling them. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever get outbid on a Charles Schultz? Uh, I did get outbid on a Charles Adams scarf. Oh. Uh, somebody sniped me. And, um, Not cool. I was so, so upset that I wound up doing like a cartoon about it <laughs> that, um, that I posted to Instagram. And it was really like, I just hope you like your, you know, <laughs> scarf that you, you know, really just, you know, I hope you just really enjoy that. Now, uh, you must get asked this all the time, but it, it, is the idea the, f the first thing and then the, the drawing comes afterwards? Uh, mostly, yeah. Um, although occasionally a, an idea will come from like doodling. Um, but mostly it's the idea first. In fact, we, we, at The New Yorker, the cartoons were originally called idea drawings, hmm. um, so, which is sort of interesting because that's what they are. Yeah. You know, uh, and not it, future scarves. Not future <laughs> scarves, no. <laughs> there is, though, I mean, it is, it is a, a, a very unique kind of comedic talent because you write in the book that you get ideas for cartoons sometimes in your dreams and they're usually bad. They're usually Can you terrible. tell me about <laughs> the Willard of Oz and Tad Less So? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm telling you, they're really stupid. Um, What's the, who's uh, the Willard of Oz? Willard of Oz is just this, like, really schlebby, kind of dopey sort of guy. And uh, he's not the Wiz, he's Willard of Oz. But I thought that the Tad, Le it was, you know, Ted Lasso, yeah. that Tad Lasso was kind of, you know, it was like, well, brain, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not a terribly, you know, funny cartoon, but it's interesting, you know, that... Uh, but that that's the dreaming brain likes puns it likes wordplay mm. and that has been written about huh. i know this is this book is not about the science of dreaming or the science of sleep but you have obviously spent a lot of time thinking about it and just based on your kind of anecdotal research what what is your guess as to like what our brains are trying to do when we dream um i think well i at the end of the book i do have a pie chart and because uh, <laughs> cartoonists need to make pie charts, we just do. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I mean, if I had to, you know, of course, Freud and Jung being the two biggies from the 20th mm -hmm. century, um, I sort of fall more in the Jungian side of things. I kind of like that, that idea that uh, dreams connect to the uh, collective unconscious in mm. that they tap into some part of our brains where we are all connected. And Fran Leibowitz is there. And Fran Le <laughs> everybody is there. You yeah. know, yeah. That's, uh, th that's the whole thing. Well, thanks for being here. The book is I Must Be Dreaming. Roz Chast, everybody, right here on Live. Thank you. That was Roz Chast right here on LiveWire. Her latest book, I Must Be Dreaming, is available right now. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We have got to take a very quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, we are going to hear some music from the incredible Black Belt Eagle Scout. Stay with us. Livewire is thrilled to be partnering with Portland's own Portal T this season. Formerly known as Tea Chai Tay, Portal Tea is the premier tea company in the Pacific Northwest. And they make one of a kind handcrafted tea blends like cinnamon churro chai and blueberry cream Earl Grey. Use the code LiveWire, all lowercase, for 20% off at portaltea.co. Welcome back to LiveWire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get to our musical guest this week, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be talking to award-winning author and journalist Hector Tobar about 
what it means to him anyway uh, to be Latino in America. Uh, His latest book is Our Migrant Souls, A Meditation on Race and the Meanings and Myths of Latino. And in it, he aims to try to discover the Latino identity, what it is, uh, what it isn't. We're going to talk to Hector about growing up in L.A. uh, with his family and why he thinks Star Wars might be the ultimate Latino film. Uh, We're also going to talk to comedian and filmmaker Jenna Friedman about her memoir, Not Funny, which is misleading because Jenna is, in fact, very funny. Although there is one joke or sort of topic that she will probably avoid going forward. We're going to get an explanation on that next week. Uh, Then we're going to hear a cover of Tom Waits by one of our very favorite bands, the sister trio Joseph. So it is going to be an amazing show next week. Do not miss it. Uh, In the meantime, our musical guest this week grew up on the Swinomish Indian tribal community in LaConnor, Washington, where she was influenced by the cultural singing and drumming of her family, as well as bootleg tapes of Hole and Nirvana. Rolling Stone calls her latest album, The Land, The Water, The Sky, fiery and brilliant. Uh, This is Black Belt Eagle Scout, who joined us at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Well, let's uh, hear a song. What are we going to hear? I'm going to play a song called Nobody. Okay. Yeah. This is Black Belt Eagle Scout right here on Livewire.
That was Black Belt Eagle Scout right here on Livewire. Make sure to check out her latest album, The Land, The Water, The Sky. All right, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. Huge thanks to our guests, Sloan Crosley, Roz Chast, and Black Belt Eagle Scout. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. And our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Eben Hoffer, Leona Skinner-Kinderman, and Molly Pettit are our technical directors. And our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Trey Hester is our assistant editor. Our marketing and production manager is Karen Pan. Rosa Garcia is our operations associate. Jackie Ibarra is our production fellow. Happy birthday! And Becky Phillips is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. This episode was mixed by Molly Pettit and Trey Hester. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Arts Commission, a state agency funded by the state of Oregon and the National Endowment for the Arts. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff this week. We would like to thank members Heidi Festin of Brandywine, Maryland, and Daniel Muller of Banks, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire team. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a piping hot episode of Livewire delivered right to your heart and ears each week? Well, guess what? That can happen when you subscribe to the Livewire podcast feed and you'll get the joy of surprising conversation every week. So go ahead and do it. It's super easy. You click on the button at the top of your podcast app and bam, you are Livewire subscribed. And If you're still, you know, feeling the love, if you're enjoying the show, hey, maybe you could hook us up and uh, leave us a quick review. That'll help more people find out about Livewire. And thank you.